April the 25th, 1915, men of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps landed at Gallipoli. It was on that day the traditions of our fighting forces were born. These stories of their sons and daughters at war we proudly dedicate to the memory of Anzac. Here, approaching Sydney's Great Harbour, are the ships which today stand guard over the 12,000 miles of an island continent's coastline. They are the ships of the Royal Australian Navy. In this programme of Anzac, you will see something of the Royal Australian Navy in action in World War II. And I believe you'll be very proud of what you see. Between the wars, there were many changes. The veteran cruiser Sydney was broken up in 1929. The seaplane carrier Albatross was transferred to the Royal Navy as part payment for a modern cruiser to replace Sydney. In 1933, the RAN was strengthened by the arrival from Britain of the flotilla leader Stuart and four other destroyers, Vampire, Vendetta, Voyager and Waterhen, all built in 1918. This was the famous Scrap Iron Flotilla. The new HMAS Sydney joined the squadron. Cockatoo Island Dockyard worked all out to build new warships and modernise old ones. The heavy cruiser, Australia, the RAN's most powerful unit, was refitted. Two new sloops, Parramatta and Warrigo, were launched. When war broke out, the RAN was ready with an effective fighting force of two 8-inch gun and four 6-inch gun cruisers, five destroyers and two sloops. HMAS Cerberus, the ship that never goes to sea. This is the Navy's name for Flinders Naval Depot in Victoria. Here, thousands of reservists called up for the wartime Navy learned to be sailors. They were kitted up. Brush boots, brush polishing, brush clothes, brush hair, brush tooth, hat, navel, heart. The call to eat, and could they eat? The bugle to work. There was still training in the old arts of sail. A day in the whaler was a pleasant break. But a day in the cutter was hard work. Navigation class. They had nearly everything to learn. Everything but the will to fight. Even sailors had to do their share of square bashing. Knees bent. Physical fitness was as necessary as mental alertness. Left. Left. Pick up your feet there. Might as well have joined the infantry. Rifle drill. The sailor has to know how to fight ashore, too. No longer raw recruits. They march with an air. But the Rockies, as the long service men call them, still had much to learn. The signalman had to know the Morse code. Flag drill was a special art in itself. A high degree of technical skill was required before a man was entitled to wear the badge of a torpedo specialist. Gunnery practice. Enemies from the sky had to be fought too in this grim new naval warfare. Meanwhile, launchers and motor cruisers had been taken over by the Navy for harbour defence and coastal patrol work. Without uniforms, medals or glory, the men of the merchant service played their heroic part. Guns were mounted on merchant ships to give them some chance to hit back. Naval ratings were assigned to merchantmen to take charge of the guns. Mm -hmm. 
As a protection against mines, these devices, called paravanes, were screened on either side of ships underway. Minesweepers, some of them converted trawlers, went out to sweep the sea lanes around Australia. German raiders had sown mines around the Australian and New Zealand coasts and had claimed their first victim, the Trans-Pacific Liner Niagara, sunk 60 miles from Auckland. More and still more trained men were needed, but now the training faced the harsh test of war. Australian warships were at action stations. All round the world, in the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, the Caribbean. In the Mediterranean, Sydney and the Scrap Iron Flotilla were already engaged against heavy odds. One of the important tasks of the RAN was to escort Australian troops to the Middle East. HMS Ramillies, a 29,000-ton British battleship, joined Australian cruisers to escort the first AIF convoy which sailed from Sydney on January the 10th, 1940. In the Western Desert, Bardio was bombarded by HMAS Sydney while the AIF prepared to attack. The great naval base of Alexandria in Egypt was home port for Sydney and the Scrap Iron Flotilla. From Alexandria, Sydney sailed to win her greatest victory. Supported only by destroyers, she engaged two Italian cruisers and sank one of them, the Bartolomeo Colleoni. Wacko Sydney, signaled Captain Hick Waller of HMAS Stewart, and every ship in Alexandria cheered the Sydney's return. 500 Italians had been rescued from the water when the Colleoni went down, 50 of them seriously wounded. Sydney's victory over a superior force struck a deadly blow at the morale of the Italian Navy. One of Sydney's sailors was wounded by the splinter. Captain John Collins, commanding Sydney, had reason to be proud. He had won Australia's first naval victory of the war. Well done, signalled Admiral Cunningham. On the quarterdeck of the triumphant cruiser, Captain Collins assembled his crew to read to them the Admiral's signal and add his own praise for the gallant way they had borne themselves. It had been a great day for Australia. Sydney suffered only one direct hit in her forehead funnel. The ship's company toiled to make her again, in all respects, ready for sea and to engage the enemy. Early in 1941, HMAS Perth replaced Sydney in the Mediterranean. Two new Australian destroyers, Nizam and Napier, had joined the Mediterranean fleet. Yeoman signaller Sharky Ward flashes a signal, while on the bridge of Nizam, her navigator, Lieutenant Miller, stands watch. Signalman Fred Tebbett hands her captain, Lieutenant Commander Nobby Clark, a signal which sends her to sea again. Perth and the Australian destroyers played a heroic part in the evacuation under punishing German air attack of troops from Greece and Crete, including the men of the Anzac Corps.
thousands of Australian and New Zealand soldiers owed their lives and their liberty to the Navy. They were anxious days for the Navy. The Luftwaffe ruled the skies. Meantime, HMAS Sydney had returned to Sydney from the Mediterranean. The Governor-General, Lord Gowrie, escorted by Captain Collins, met her officers and congratulated her company. While abroad, she had steamed no less than 66,000 miles and had been almost continuously in action. At last, after the long months overseas, they were sure leave at home. Her sailors had no premonition as they thronged the Liberty boats, but their proud ship was doomed, and that before the year was out, not one of that gallant company would be alive. In November 1941, Sydney, now under Captain Burnett, was engaged by the disguised German raider Cormoran. In a point-blank action, they destroyed one another. And now Japan, with her powerful navy, brought desperate peril to Australia. In 1942, there were naval actions and landings throughout the South Pacific. Australian and American warships were heavily engaged, among them the Australian heavy cruiser Canberra. The Japanese thrust towards Australia was checked in a series of brilliant air-sea battles. First time in the war, amphibious operations with warships supporting landing forces became the pattern of conflict. Air attack and HMAS Australia's guns go into action, followed by the guns of American warships. the decisive battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, the Japanese fleet received blows from which it never recovered. In August 1942, American Marines landed on Guadalcanal. Amongst the ships covering the landing was HMAS Canberra. Japanese warships struck in Sabo Strait. Taken by surprise at night, Canberra was mortally hit. Japanese guns raked Canberra and her American consorts with deadly fire. She was soon aflame from stem to stern. Australia mourned her loss. A memorial service for Canberra was held in St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney. Australians were joined in homage by American sailors. Also paying their respects to their Australian allies was a contingent of free French sailors. The widow of Captain Frank Getting, Canberra's gallant commander, attended the service escorted by Rear Admiral Muir Head Gould. To replace Canberra, the cruiser Shropshire was loaned to Australia by Britain had been grievous. Sydney and Canberra had gone down. The cruiser Perth and the sloop Yarra had been sunk in gallant actions in Sunder Strait. Other smaller ships of the RAN had sacrificed themselves against heavy odds. Ceaselessly, the dockyards toiled to build new ships of war to take their place in the RAN's battle line. From Australian dockyards were also launched ships for the Royal Navy and the Royal Indian Navy. Destroyers and new warship types, called by the old names, corvette and frigate, were designed to meet changing conditions of sea warfare.
Mrs. Frank Ford, wife of the Deputy Prime Minister, launches a new vessel. This was a scene which became almost commonplace as Australia's naval building program gathered momentum. But no repetition could dull the sense of excitement and achievement as another new ship was born and took to the sea. Typical of the new ships was the corvette Castlemaine. Castlemaine, with her 650 tons, her 15 and a half knot speed, and her single four inch gun, took up coastal patrol work in perilous waters to the north of Australia. The engineers, unsung heroes of many a naval battle. It's peaceful enough now, but danger can come suddenly. The crew run to stations in a practice alert. Meanwhile, Australia and Shropshire were helping to cover American landings on New Britain. American warships worked with the two Australian cruisers and the Australian destroyers Arunta and Warramunga. In the strenuous island campaigning, there was little time to rest. When there was, Australia's crew made the most of it. But yet another landing lay ahead. In pre-dawn darkness, the troops in their barges waited. Landing barges hit the beach. American troops wade ashore and prepare to attack. The pattern of the landing was repeated many times as the Allied thrust gained momentum. And in all these amphibious operations, ships and men of the Royal Australian Navy played their part, working with their American comrades in arms. Typical of these operations was the landing at Arrowy, New Britain. Captain Collins boarded Shropshire for the attack on Hollandia. Shropshire's gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Warwick Bracegirdle, briefed his gunners. On Shropshire's bridge, Captain Collins scanned the coast of New Guinea for signs of enemy reaction. Alarm! Enemy aircraft approaching. Action stations. bells and all's well. At Ley, the 9th Division AIF attacked from the sea. As 
the men of the 9th Division moved in for Australia's first amphibious operation since Gallipoli, ships of the RAN gave covering fire. With the Japanese reeling under repeated blows, the Pacific War moved to its victorious conclusion. Lying off every beachhead as Allied troops drove north towards Japan was a host of ships of the Royal Australian Navy. Among them, Australia, Shropshire, Arunta, Waramunga, Hobart, Hawkesbury, Baku, and Lachlan, Manura, Westralia, Canimbla. At Labuan, at Balikpapan, from beachhead to beachhead, the Australians thrust forward. Wherever Australian soldiers fought, their comrades of the Navy were there with them and forged links of comradeship which endured beyond the final victory. And now, in this uneasy peace, the Navy remembers those who served so valiantly in war. In the new Naval Chapel on the southern headland of Sydney Harbour, Padre Long conducts a service of commemoration with the congregation of the naval ratings of today. God, who has united us as shipmates in the bond of fellowship, enable us to be worthy of those who have served before. In remembering their sacrifice, may we claim as our heritage a portion of their spirit, and in peace or war, take up their sort of service. So shall the living and the dead. Her Majesty's Navy, whereon, under the good providence of God, the wealth, safety and strength of the kingdom so much depend.